but that gender-based discrimination and the so-called honour abuse, uh, which you've heard so much about from speakers this morning, and Marie is one of my heroines. She set us off with a fantastic start that so many speakers often have highlighted these issues. And of course, they are associated with diverse cultures and religious traditions. But, and this is the focus of my presentation this morning, is an association of these phenomena, particularly with the growth of Sharia courts and councils and the systematic application of Sharia law in our country today. It should not be here. Well, you have to put that in context. The vast majority, of course, of the world's 1.2 billion Muslims are law-abiding, hospitable people. But there is a growth of militant Islamists and politically strategic Muslims were working to impose their political agenda in the UK and global domination by various means. Put that briefly into this important caveat, not caveat, but important aspect of the issue. We must extend a hand of friendship to those Muslims who are trying to develop their own theological and political interpretations compatible with religious tolerance, women's rights and democratic freedoms. There are these people that are in our midst and they are brave, brave people. My research, a colleague um, in Parliament, uh, is actually a Muslim woman's barrister. She suffered a forced marriage, FGM. She is a Muslim, but she hates Sharia law, and she's been one of my most redoubtable uh, allies in, get in getting other Muslim women to try to stand up for their rights in this country. Courageous people, if you'd seen the um, film, The Honor Diaries, uh, last Wednesday, this was, going, this was very much a topic of the discussion, I do agree with Anne Marie, it was a great pity it didn't identify the main theological basis of much of this abuse of women. But examples of ways in which representatives of political Islam in Western liberal democracies are using the freedoms of democracy to achieve political change which will destroy that democracy and the freedoms which it enshrines. Can identify the seven forms of strategic jihad, jihad in this case uh, being that commitment to obtain the conquest of the world. And I'm going to go very quickly through uh, five of those um, and then concentrate on the legal, the Sharia law aspects. But we need to put this in a slightly bigger context. Political jihad, um, freedom of speech. Some years ago there was an attempt, as a bill was going through Parliament, you might remember. Uh, to use that bit of legislation to inhibit freedom of speech. It would have been a criminal offence, punishable by up to six years in prison, to say anything critical of Islam, to promote any other faith, or to make jokes about Islam. It wasn't on the face of that proposed bill, but it was between the lines. Fortunately, we were able to identify it, and Anthony Lester, or Lester of Herne Hill, ran with the major amendments to protect these fundamental freedoms. Anne-Marie said earlier on, we're likely to be called racist, but I think we anticipated that one. We've got to think strategically. So we've got a lot of the leaders of the black communities uh, who hate Sharia law, who do try to enjoy the freedoms of democracy, to come and demonstrate. So we had our second reading, the pavement opposite was jam-packed uh, with our friends from different colours, and we were able to stand up and say, don't you call us racist. Look at the Africans, look at the Asians out there who are demonstrating in favour of freedom of speech. So we scoffed the racist one. But um, Anthony Lester and a group of us uh, were able to brief other peers as to the dangers of what was happening. Um, you may remember Mr. Bean. Uh, he came and briefed the peers. He wasn't in the least bit funny. He told them the deadly seriousness of what it means when you lose fundamental freedoms of speech. And the Lord's Amendments were agreed, they were put on, not agreed, they were voted against government, put on in the House of Lords. Tony Blair's administration, under great pressure from the Muslim Council of Britain, was determined to remove those freedom amendments, and Britain's freedom hung by a thread on that day. Uh, the leaders of the black communities came back and they lobbied a number of Labour MPs, they changed the minds of nine Labour MPs, and when the vote came to do away with the Lord's amendments to freedom, the first vote was lost by 10, and then the whips got busy. And our freedom hung by a thread on that day. Uh, the second vote was lost by one vote. And they'll come back again and again, so we must protect our fundamental freedoms. Cultural jihad, the battle for the mind, Saudi Arabia in particular, is putting massive 
fantastic money into universities and of course promoting with that all the attitudes which go with their particular um, ways of living and belief and practices and schools. And just earlier this week there was a report in the papers which you may have read by local Muslim communities and a number of local authorities have been systematically plotting and contriving ways in which to intimidate and to castigate heads of schools to replace them with Islamist head teachers. So another area to watch. Demographic jihad. Demographic jihad, the religiously sanctioned and, in this country, government permitted polygamy, which not only has a demographic effect, but also, as we will see in a moment, creates such suffering for many Muslim women. Financial jihad. Financial jihad. Prime Ministers Blair, Brown and Cameron have all declared strong support for the UK's compliance with Sharia finance and expressed a wish to see London, the UK, becoming the world centre for Sharia finance. How incredibly kamikaze can we get? And moving to the main focus of what I want to share with you today, the legal jihad and the introduction of Sharia law into the UK. There are now over 80 Sharia courts in the UK which we know about, and they pose a fundamental threat to that fundamental principle of democracy, of one law of all. And it's wonderful to work with one law for all um, campaign and organisation uh, trying to defend this particular principle. And also through the inherent religiously sanctioned gender discrimination, which inflicts such great suffering on many Muslim women and children in our country today. Something would make our suffragettes turn in their graves, but we're letting it happen. Just two quotations from those of women who have been speaking to me. I'm speaking as a British Muslim. I would like to say I feel terribly let down by the British state, with its schizophrenic responses to the law, its own law, its abrogation of its responsibility in safeguarding the rights of Muslim women. And another one said to me, and she was crying. I feel betrayed by Britain. I came here to get away from all this, but the situation here is worse than in my country of origin. Well, just to remind ourselves, what are those aspects of gender discrimination under Sharia law that's being carried out in our country today? First of all, and this is a general point, um, and it's the quote as you can read it, although Sharia councils are said to mediate in family matters, they have a different understanding of that term, mediation, and fail to distinguish between mediation and arbitration. Councils often call themselves courts, and the presiding imams are cited judges. According to the British Sharia Council, for example, quote, in changing times, fulfills the criteria for consultative processes in regard to domestic problems, works as a Sharia court. Their decisions are imposed and seen by the recipients very often to be legal judgments. Another quote, many women in Muslim communities in Britain believe, and men who know better can benefit by failing to correct them, that a marriage in a mosque and before imams in Britain constitutes a valid marriage. In the event of a dispute and an attempt to enforce their rights through the British courts, they are shocked to discover that, unless married in one of the very few mosques registered as places for civil ceremonies, they are not validly married in the eyes of British law. We heard that but very well this morning by yourself, and it is such an important point. I first was aware of this some years ago when I actually asked the House of Lords at the dispatch, Minister of the Dispatch Box, what happens to a Muslim woman if she has only had a religious marriage and not a legal civil marriage in the event of divorce? Does she have any rights at all? And the minister, several years ago, said no, she does not. What's the government done about it since then? Absolutely nothing. And honestly, this is my most recent endeavour in this field. I tried to move an amendment to the bill just recently going through, um, and it was unsuccessful. All I tried to do was to introduce an amendment which would require anyone carrying out a religious marriage, whatever the faith which was not simultaneously recognised as a civil and legal marriage, to ensure that both participants, the man and the woman, understood the far-reaching implications. Seems pretty innocuous, doesn't it? If you're, you know, if you're going to get married in a religious ceremony, you're not going to get that legal marriage, you're utterly vulnerable. Isn't it 
sensible to ask that someone to make sure the person was not from that marriage, that their particular woman knows her vulnerability? Oh no, the government didn't want to know this. Everyone always has right to the access of the laws of this land, and anyway, it might affect or it might upset the community leaders. This is a case, I believe, where so many cases where we are allowed culture and political accountability to override our legal obligations to the citizens of this land. It's happening in Tunisia, it's happening in FGM, it's happening in so many cases. And one of the dates I want to do, maybe help with this, is get together a massive collection of examples where we have allowed the officials, the people responsible, the professionals for ensuring that the law of this land is fulfilled on behalf of vulnerable people to concede, to give way, because of cultural sensitivities and political correctness and not wanting to upset the local community leaders. I want to get a dossier of evidence and then call the government to account for failing to put the law of the land first and allow the so-called multiculturalism and cultural sensitivities to override, abrogate the law of this land. It should not happen and it's happening all the time and it's time we really called our government to account. Girls and women only automatically receive half of any legacy given to boys and men. Divorce. A husband can unilaterally divorce his wife, sometimes merely by declaring that divorce three times. So many constraints apply to a wife who wishes to divorce from her husband under his own rule. She may have to obtain her husband's permission. She often has to um, pay for that, um, and very often she won't have that money. And it was quite interesting, I was talking to uh, some of the uh, leading uh, religious leaders in one of our leading mosques in this country. And I said, well, you know, women have to pay, often 200 pounds, 400 pounds, uh, the men don't. You know, why don't the men have to pay? Surely they're part of this whole business. And there wasn't an answer, they said, well, the men just sort of disappear. But the women have to pay, the men don't. And talking to one Muslim woman who said to me, you know, I've got to ask my husband, but there's money. But there's no way he's going to give it to me. I feel in this land there's a kind of open door to freedom and justice, but I'm sitting tied to a chair, unable to get through that door. Well, moving on. Polygamy. A man who divorces his wife is still in this country, being living here, entitled to marry again under Sharia law, and is of course permitted four wives. A divorced wife may not marry without conditions. Polygamy is right in the UK. Well, then bigamy is illegal. How schizophrenic can we get? Custody of children. Anne Marie is a great expert on this and has many poignant stories of the plight of children. And again, this is an infringement of our British legal requirements. In this country, in a divorce, a child is meant to be placed with the appropriate parent or guardian in the best interest of the child. Characteristically happens under the Sharia provisions, children born to a woman who is divorced in an Islamic marriage are, inverted commas, legally liable to be placed in the father's care from the age of seven. What a schizophrenic situation. Rape, probably know this, if a woman wants to bring a charge of alleged rape, she's obliged to provide for independent marriage witnesses. Well, give me a break. I mean, how ridiculous can you get? And the worrying thing that very often in countries we meet such as Sudan and so on, if a woman does try to plead for some help for rape, the witnesses may turn around and the case may go against her and she will be um, convicted of adultery. Yeah, the double standards are terrifying. Domestic violence. A husband is allowed to beat his wife, oh, subject to certain conditions, but it sanctions domestic violence. Unequal witnesses. In any Sharia court, a woman's evidence is counted as half the value of a man's. It was quite entertaining. I was debating a woman's hour some time back with one of the leading women uh, lawyers in this country who both works in the Western legal system and also the Sharia legal system. Highly intelligent, uh, very professional woman, Muslim. And when we got to this part, she actually said, and I had mentioned this about a woman's evidence is kind of hard, that of a man's. She actually said on Radio 4, women's are, well, of course, women tend to get confused. <laughs> she said, deep it goes into the psyche. That went 
dying woman's arm, I hope it's great for itself. And this is real and serious and grave. Intimidation. Quote, the reality is that for many Muslims, the Sharia courts are in practice part of an institutionalized atmosphere of intimidation backed by the ultimate sanction of a death threat. And we've heard this morning already in the so many more cases about the so-called honor claims. Now, just one or two very brief examples. When so badly beaten by their husbands, they're hospitalized, pressured by the community not to prosecute because it brings shame on the community, told by their imams if they go for help to a Sharia court or council that they must put family first, nothing more important than family, so to go back to their abusive husbands, give them a second chance. And then, of course, the violence is repeated. I remember talking to a lovely young lady, my heart broke, I wept with her. She described how she was married, with an Islamic marriage, appallingly um, um, treated, abused, um, such grievous bodily harm, she was hospitalised, um, then the honour, shame, sort of pressures kicked in, no, don't seek help from professionals, it will bring shame on the community, the community will help you sort it out. She was sent back to her abusive husband, suffered more, then he divorced her. He went back to country of origin, got another bride, brought her back. First wife was pretty marginalised and lonely, so she wanted an Islamic divorce. And the devout Muslim, um, the fact that she uh, didn't have an Islamic divorce and meant she didn't feel she could, in terms of her religious commitment, remarry. So she went to her Sharia court or council, and the Imam said, Oh, yeah, but you've got to get your marriage certificate um, in order to get a religious divorce. So she asked her husband for the marriage certificate. He said, It's back in country of origin. So her family, back in country of origin, went to his family to ask for the marriage certificate. They beat up her younger brother because she had brought shame on the family. And she can't get a marriage certificate, she can't be married according to her own beliefs, and seven years down the line, there is a very lonely, very unhappy young lady trapped in this system. And then just one other example, um, there was a 50-year-old lady in this country who was widowed, she wanted to remarry. She went to her mom for permission to remarry. Oh, you've got to have permission from a male relative. Don't have any male relatives. You must have one somewhere in the world. This lady had to go out to Jordan to get permission to remarry from a seven-year-old relative, male relative, I've seen it in childish Arabic, giving this 50-year-old lady in this country who was widowed permission to remarry. Happening in Britain today. Isn't it outrageous? Wouldn't our suffragettes be turning into graves? I turn, well, not my grave yet, but I certainly will if it's not rectified. Well, in an attempt to try to do something, We've introduced, and it's lovely to have uh, my noble heroine, uh, Baroness Flather, here, my wonderful colleague, is very supportive of this initiative and others. A private member's bill trying to address at least some of these issues and to raise awareness of the appalling unsatisfactory situation we are now allowed to have in this country. If anyone's interested, there's a background briefing booklet called Equal and Free? Question mark, supported by many Muslim women's organisations, including Inspire. I'm so grateful for that. I'm sorry I couldn't hear you. I had to go and repart the car. But um, I did want to hear you, but I had to do that. But I look forward to having a word. But if anyone wants a copy of that, I can send it by email. And also, the second reading debate did have support from a lot of parts of the house. If people are interested to see who is concerned and supporting this initiative, happy to send by email. But very briefly, the bill can't address all the issues, but what it will do would create a new duty on public authorities such as social workers, health workers, doctors, police, educators, schools, to inform women of their legal disadvantages of not having one of those legally registered marriages. Many, many just don't want to know about this. Secondly, make gender discrimination and irregularity in arbitration proceedings so it's easier to obtain uh, a retrospective um, annulment of such a contract. And you're probably aware that we allow in this country Muslim arbitration tribunals, they're the legit. Well, of course, many of them operate on Sharia principles, and normally um, the outcome, the contract at the end of an arbitration is legally binding. But what this bill would do, if retrospectively some woman found that it had been based on the gender discriminatory uh, principles of Sharia law, she could ask to have that legally binding contract annulled and reconsidered. Just it, well, it might help some women who are still suffering, I know they are. It's an important principle. 
But again, another thing it would do would be provide more protection for victims of domestic violence by making it clear that a victim of domestic violence is, sorry, I'm trying to read the small script, you can read it up there, by making it clear that a victim of domestic abuse is a witness to offence and therefore should be protected from intimidation. In other words, the obligation to seek help doesn't remain solely with the poor victim of the abuse, but someone else can actually ask for help on her behalf, which takes away this tremendous intimidatory pressure of the don't you dare go and seek help because it will bring shame on the community. Someone can do it on their behalf. And finally, this is where it might cut in a little bit, would be to create a new offence, the maximum five year prison sentence, to tackle the problem of pseudo courts. Someone mentioned that one of the uh, Sharia courts this morning, um, I visited one of those and they really do operate like a court. And it was a, a humiliating experience to see the treatment of the poor woman at the foot of the podium in that court. Well, further information I've already mentioned. If anyone's interested, please do be in touch. I'll give you my card. We've also established more party parliamentary group on so-called honour-based abuse to try to get the evidence. And again, I hope you'll help me with this because the response of the government uh, to this legal initiative is it's not needed. Every woman in this land has access uh, to the legal rights of this land. Well, give me a break. If you're a third young wife coming in from, say, Pakistan, as a third wife, we're told again and again by our Muslim friends that the men will typically go back very often to rural communities, find very young brides who are illiterate and vulnerable in their own societies, and bring them back to this country. And they live a kind of Taliban-like existence in some of our very close communities. Are they really likely to be able to extricate themselves from that situation and go and get their legal rights? It's I think it is a shaming situation of our government. The enormous chasm between the daily jury, what they say, yeah, everything's fine, everyone's got access to the laws of this land, and the brutal de facto, where so many women are suffering, trapped in intimidatory circumstances. So, please, we do want the evidence so we can call our government to account. And finally, just very briefly, um, deeply concerned about contemporary slavery and trafficking, just brought out a new edition of a book which highlights the extent of that in this country today. But I believe it is imperative, and because I believe it is imperative, we are the lucky ones. We've got our freedoms. We must use our freedoms to protect, speak, work for the others, the people whose freedoms are denied to them. So many, we've heard so many of this morning. And I finish with what well, motto of my little NGO heart, the say we work in Sudan, Nigeria, Burma with victims, India, of gender-based horrible, horrific suffering. In this country, this is the initiative we are trying to undertake. But sometimes when one looks around the world, the needs are so legion, the challenges are so vast, you don't know where to begin. You may feel overwhelmed or sort of paralyzed, so you don't know where to begin. Well, I'm happy to see you people here this morning do not come in that category. But my little NGO, my colleagues in Parliament, our little motto is we cannot do everything, but I must not do nothing. And if together we all really do something, we really can make a difference for some of the people suffering so much in our world, and particularly where we have a special responsibility in our country today. Thank you for letting me share the